Here we're going to cover a few uses of the user data nodes as well as the shader switches and how to control them. We're going to use a simple cloner and access the resulting data to drive procedural variation in clones as well as setting up conditions to continuously shade an infinite number of clones. So uh, let's just dive right in. We're going to get set up. So go ahead, go to MoGraph, drop a cloner, create a primitive with some edges. So I'm going to go ahead and just use a platonic. Uh, we're going to be using curvature later, so just get yourself some edges. On the cloner, just to make it easier to see, we're going to set it to linear and kind of just stagger out these clones so we have a better base reference when we initially start working here so we can see what kind of variation we're going to be seeding in into uh, all the resulting shaders. So uh, make yourself a default material. Just drop that material on the clone. And uh, go ahead and give yourself some space here because we're going to be creating quite a, quite a large amount of nodes here right away. Drag that shader switch out, and you'll see it's got a whole bunch of options on it. So uh, also going to grab the integer user data. So immediately you'll see that it has some options under attribute that you can naturally twirl down and select, which includes MoGraph data, object data, and particle data. So for this situation, we're going to go ahead and just use the object ID. And I want you to pipe that into the selector of the shader switch. So I guess I should kind of explain what we are doing here. What we did is we grabbed the individual identifier of each clone from the MoGraph object and are using it as the toggle for the shader switch. What you'll see is when we start getting uh, more materials in here, we're going to connect these to their own individual sockets, and you'll see that each it has a pretty large selection. We have got a total of nine that we can pipe into this. So uh, I guess to see it's best to see this in action to make the most sense out of it. So uh, go ahead and take your material and just plug it into the shader zero slot. So we're going to take uh, clone number zero because an array starts at zero and connect it. And you will immediately see that every clone except for clone zero turns to white, which makes sense because the shader colors are set to white in all the other slots. So uh, let's fill this out. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just make a couple default materials. This one set to gold. As you start populating the shaders, you're gonna see it kick over right away and it's fully, it'll fully respond to any changes you make in the shaders and pass them on up. So you can toggle it to aluminum and you'll see it change. If you add a, another material in here, let's drop, uh, let's drop one in the shader slot number two. You'll see the third one kick over or clone number two. Let's just set a real identifying color for that so we know what's going on. And just keep populating this to taste. It really doesn't matter what kind of material you're using here as the shader switch will pretty much accept anything. So uh, keep filling that out. Let's throw a fourth one in there. Let's just make that a little uh, darker than the others. I haven't used iron yet but you can flip through all these and really see the results. So yeah, let's just throw Jade in there because that's substantially different. Um, you can see we populated out the five, the initial five clones from clone zero through four, and that we got slots five through nine still available uh, as white. So, you know, if we add more clones and we zoom out here, it's very obvious that, you know, it's going to default to the white if there is no shader that clearly tells it what to, what to do. So at this point, you're probably asking, how can we use only nine shader slots to essentially seed variation to an infinite number of clones? Um, and there's a variety of ways we can approach this and set some conditions up in this shader so that either A, we generate randomness procedurally based off of the individual IDs of the objects and are using that to like offset textures, offset uh, gains, and offset certain values to kind of give per clone variation. Uh, or are we going to set up like a uh, modulo where we are essentially rolling over the uh, shader switch every time, rolling through the shaders up to number nine and then resetting to the first one as we go along. So we're gonna cover both of those sections. We're gonna cover how to do procedural variations uh, per clone and then as well how to set up the shader switch to pretty much uh, be able to infinitely issue uh, materials to an infinite number of clones. I mean, of course, you're going to be limited to the base nine, but it will be able to cycle through those base nine and go from there. So hopefully you can set up your shader to work within that uh, that paradigm. So uh, let's dive in and just make a new material. 
and I'm just going to call this noise material because we're going to be putting a little bit of grime, a little bit of grit on it. I'm just going to connect it to shader five. It's in there and let's add that last clone to make sure it's detecting it. Yes, there we go. So if you've watched any of the previous tutorials in this series, this is going to be pretty easy to follow and I'm not going to necessarily explain this in its entirety. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take the platonic and create some procedural edge wear. I'm just going to drop a ramp in line, crush down the noise a little bit to make it a little more obvious where, where we're at and where it's at on the object. It's a little difficult to see the reflection in there, so let's go a little bit more reflective uh, on this material. Let's set that to platinum. It's also probably a good time to go ahead and add some lighting in the scene to get move away from the default because it's going to become a little more increasingly difficult to really see the specifics of this uh, reflection roughness and reflection weight edge wear we're going to make. So just going to build myself a dome light real quick and drag in the same HDRI I've been using on this entire series. Uh, and now it becomes way more apparent where that noise is and what this ramp is doing to crush out that reflection roughness. Also, going to grab a curvature and going to grab a color composite. I'm going to use the curvature to control this noise just on the edge of this platonic specifically. So uh, if you plug in the curvature, I'm just going to plug it in diffuse for reference right now and turn the weight to one so I can see it. And immediately you'll see the curvature trigger on the platonic. Let's just open this guy up a little bit and give it a ramp so that we can crush it down to the ranges that we needed to get the result we want. Curvature is going to be the blend color and the base color is going to be the noise. And we're going to plug that into diffuse and immediately we'll see it's the base color because the composite mode is set to base. Instead, let's set it to multiply as we want to knock the faces out and just get some edge wear. I'm going to kind of crush the bright of this ramp down a bit so that we can see more of the edge. And I'm actually going to reuse the same noise that we have uh, going into the face and then use that to agitate the curvature a little bit. And so we'll get some nice alignment on the noise underneath and the map that we're making for reflection roughness. So plug that back into the reflection roughness and you'll see when we adjust the camera angle a little bit here, we got some little bit of edge wear and some just like procedurally generated uh, curvature driven edge stuff. We can, you know, boost the bias a little bit and you'll see you'll get some of the face back, but uh, we'll leave the bias up a little bit so that we can get some a clarity on where the roughness is on these maps. So uh, now we're going to take this a step further after a little bit of cleanup here. Um, let's add some more clones. And as we expected earlier, the next ones we add are white as well. So let's fill out that shader slot and let's just add a few more. Drop that into slot five, six, seven, eight. And I'm actually just going to go all the way to the end here and fill it all the way to slot nine. And when we kind of turn it on the outside here and look a little bit closer, you can see that on the edge that all these clones are sharing the exact same attributes that the wear is in the exact same positions on each one of them and that is clearly not what we want. So you can see the specific chunks like these two upper ones or that lower one uh, are repeated across all these clones. And what we're gonna do next is plug in some user data to randomize this out and get some true variation in all the clones. Go ahead and grab the scalar user data node and under that go to attribute and objects and geometry ID normalized. We're gonna take that output and plug it right into the noise and under coordinates, you'll see there's a coordinate offset input and go ahead and plug that in right away. Uh, if you were paying attention to your Redshift viewport, you notice that something has immediately changed. That clustering of the exact same damage in the exact same spot on that edge all of a sudden has shifted and every single instance here now has a randomized noise pattern. And to add a little extra layer of control, we're also going to go and look for a RS mole node, which is essentially just a multiply operation. And we're going to drop that in line after the scalar user data and just plug it into input one. For now, we're going to set input two to one so that everything that goes in stays the same, connect it, and you'll notice everything stays the same. 
uh, when you plug in different values, let's choose a arbitrary value like 1.325, and when you do, you'll notice the noise starts to evolve and shift and get a little bit uh, greater distance and a little bit more variation between all the clones. So when you compare the edges, every single one kind of has a different point in the noise offset as the scalar user data will change across every single individual node. Everyone will have a unique seed that is being offset by, uh, and then we are multiplying it by an arbitrary value to kind of like multiply that intensity and increase the distance that it is offsetting. So now that we've kind of seen how that scalar user data works, let's look at it and kind of identify what it's doing a little more concretely so you understand what we were doing there. Uh, I'm gonna make a, another material and grab a user scalar data, grab another material, and just for now, I'm gonna plug it into the diffuse color and use that as a reference material. Uh, you could also always take that user data, plug it directly into the output, but I'm gonna be using this material further down the line. While we're at it, I'm also gonna set the scene up again to be a little clearer to see. I'm gonna put a dome light in there uh, at white and full power so we can tell a little clearly, more clearly what's going on. Also going to go into attribute name and grab the same variable as before, grabbing RS GeoID and plugging it in. Uh, just taking a look, it should become immediately apparent that each individual cube kind of has its own tone, has its own thing. And this is how the scalar user data manifests itself in kind of a diffuse situation. If you were to plug it into the diffuse channel, every, it would get variations in tone that are unique across every single cloner. Uh, you notice that when we plugged it into the coordinate offset in the texture, it offset each one uniquely. And if you plug it into the diffuse color, it'll give each one a slightly unique tone. And we're gonna use this to kind of see the unique look of each of these individual clones. So go ahead and set this up similarly to how we've done before in the past. I'm gonna grab a noise. I'm gonna grab a color composite and I'm just going to arbitrarily multiply the default noise over the scalar user data uh, and we get slightly noisier scalar user data. So at this point, it's also worth mentioning that scalar user data is not the only node that we can use to seed up randomization in our clones. There's a bunch of other ways that we can do it, and the one we're gonna do next is uh, embed it in the integer user data node. And before we plug that guy in, uh, go and grab, it's under MoGraph. We'll, for this sake, use object ID. And I'm gonna go and plug that into the coordinate scale. Once you connect that guy, if you check in your viewport, you'll see there is a variety of scales that are happening across all the clones. Although you can see at the beginning and the end, it's not really working too great. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and throw a RS div in there and I'm gonna go and divide the end result here by two. So you'll see that that uh, clone number one, and two, and three, and all the ones beyond that, they will become more pronounced as they get a smaller scale. It is worth noting at this point that the integer data we're pulling from the MoGraph ID is natively not a na naturally randomized uh, piece of information. When we're feeding it in straight, you'll see that the very first clone, clone zero, will have no scale, and the texture will essentially break because it has a scale of zero and you will not necessarily see anything. As you look down the progression, you look at the first clone, it has a scale of one, clone two has a scale of two, and on all the way until however many IDs you have. The trick here is to wrangle it down in a way that is, that is repetitive and is within the range that you want for the effect that you're going for. Uh, we're not going for anything in specific, so we're just gonna kind of ballpark some of these changes here and kind of wrangle this down and get so a uh, cyclical nature, some noise and evolving noise in all these clones. So the first thing we're gonna do is just set a floor, a minimum value, and we're gonna use a simple add operation for that guy. So connect the output of the integer data to the input one and set input two here. We're just gonna set a value arbitrarily so we can make sure it works to 0.25 and you'll see clone zero instantly has discernible texture on it. And this will let us start to figure out the range of values we're gonna use to loop this noise. So go back into the div and let's turn that value up. And as we inspect all the clones, you'll see we're going to get stuff that is more in the ballpark in the range of what we're looking for. If this last clone here has noise that's in the scale that we can actually see, we're starting to wrangle this data range into something that we can use. And while we're over here, let's just uh, let's reuse this scalar user data. 
I'm going to plug it into the uh, coordinate offset of this noise. So it may be important when you're working to do this to generate randomization that works in ways that you won't be able to see the tiling based on the project that you're doing. So uh, plugging in the scalar data into the coordinate offset here may be another way uh, for something that you're doing in the future to guarantee that there's offsets and we're getting enough randomization in all the clones. The last function we're going to go ahead and insert in this uh, little node branch we've built out here is the modulo node. Um, if you you may be familiar with the concept of it, but pretty much what it's going to do is the data that is passed to it, we're going to give it a divisor, and what it returns or outputs will be the remainder of that calculation. So if you've done long division in high school, this is kind of like that. So this is the remainder, it's gonna feed back the remainder, and when we plug it into the coordinate scale, you'll see that when we inspect all the clones we've got here, we're gonna start seeing more of a larger global cycle. So uh, you can turn this divisor uh, into any value you really need to suit your needs. Uh, play with this a bit and kind of see what cycles you like. Feel free to revise your floor value, your division, and then set your modulo value to something that works the way you expect it to. So at this point, we're just going to have a little bit of fun and finish out this tutorial and kind of mix and match the shader switch and this randomly seeded shader we got built up at the top here. So I'm just going to switch it over to a different style cloner and going to go into the material we got here, convert that just to a default gold material. And instead of having this in the diffuse, just as we demonstrated in previous sections, we're going to plug this black and white map into the reflection weight and take a look at what we got. So We've increased the clone count pretty substantially here, so you can see that the randomization on all these individual segments is still good. You can keep increasing the count here and the shader will react uh, accordingly to it. At this point, we're gonna kind of go all the way and combine this randomized shader we built in conjunction with our shader switch. So let's just reconnect our shader switch and when you reconnect it, you'll immediately notice that the objects that exceed count of nine, you'll see the first row, the nine objects have a shader in each of them, but then each one outside of that is set to white. Now we're gonna handle this the exact same way that we handled the cyclical nature of the randomized noise we did in the previous pipe, but instead we're gonna pipe this in between the integer user data feeding it the MoGraph ID. And we're gonna set that divisor and we're gonna go and just reconnect that shader switch back to the output. And let's set this modulo to something that will actually get us an effect that we want. So setting it to 18, you see we're still getting some white elements in there. So let's figure out a good rounding. There we go. Um, if we set the modulo to 9, since there's nine switches, it'll cycle through all of them and then repeat again from the beginning. You can see that if we set it down to lower numbers, it'll change the distribution and the way it cycles through the shaders that we pre-built already here. So if we set it to nine, it'll go through the full cycle. If we set it to six, it'll go through the partial cycle, but it will always return and always end up cycling through the amount of shaders that we have. And the last thing we're gonna do is just take this final material that we made on the top and just arbitrarily start connecting it to a couple shader switches. You'll see it'll pipe right in. It'll keep our normalized geometry ID uh, variation. At this point, I think we've reached a pretty good stopping point at the end of the tutorial as we've covered a pretty good variety of cases and uses for the data nodes and a shader switch that Redshift makes available to us. We've covered a variety of topics including setting up your shader, shader switch for a simple cloner, building a material that has procedural variation based not only on global ID but MoGraph ID, and then pipe them all into a shader switch that ends up cycling on an infinite number of clones. So. Hope you learned something in this and hopefully this informs ways that you're going to be able to build and kind of come up to creative solutions with the projects that you have.